Hi, so I'm Alistair and I'm here to present our uh, team's work on automated sleep stage annotation. I'm Alistair and I'm a software engineer at Apple. Jonathan is a software engineer at Ultimate Software. Eugene is a software engineer at Apple as well. And Joel is a software engineer at General Electric. This is basically a multi-class um, sleep stage classification for a given patient's sleep stage. So why automate sleep stage annotation? What's important about it? Well, first of all, sleep is key. It helps with learning and memory management, particularly with both short and long-term memories, and it promotes healthy immune system development. Um, and annotating sleep data has a lot of uh, potential benefits if we know, if we gain the insight on how to automate it. It allows for faster diagnosis of multiple sleep disorders, particularly sleep apnea. It allows us to detect if there's a particularly particular imbalance on a new tested pharmaceutical drug that's out there or a new ex uh, medical experiment that's being run on a given patient and whether that affects their sleep. It allows us for richer consumer products, particularly with the rise of wearables and the Internet of Things that can lead to uh, better sleep tracking. And it also improves the accuracy of the sleep stage classification process, which at the moment is and historically has been a human centered, human operator centered and human error prone uh, manner. So how does sleep uh, data look like? Well, sleep data is recorded using EEGs, electroencephalograms. They're basically a recording of the brainwave patterns used uh, judging from its electrical signals. Now, EEG values are composed of multiple brain waves that uh, combine to form that one EEG signal. Uh, there are waves like the alpha waves, beta waves, so on and so forth. Physionet has five sleep stages ranging from wake three non-rapid eye movement stages and the rapid eye movement stage itself, whereas the SHHS dataset has six sleep stages, ranging from wake, uh, four non-rapid eye movement sleep stages, and the rapid eye movement sleep stage itself. So how do we measure success? Well, we have four metrics. We have area under the curve, accuracy score, balance accuracy score, and the F1 score. Um, we use the AUC uh, score particularly for a neural, our neural network models. Um, and it's more helpful for the neural network models for that regard. Whereas we use the accuracy, balanced accuracy, and the F1 scores for the shallow uh, machine learning methods that we've used. We also have used um, loss uh, plots. We've used loss plots for our neural network models as well to see how much um, loss, uh, how much each model has negatively performed or positively performed. So how did we source the data from the internet? Well, the both data sets were obtained freely from the internet. The SHHS the, the data set was more guarded off and needed permissions, whereas Physionet was more generally available. The SHHS data set has two sensors each sampling values at 125 hertz, which means there's 125 values that are sampled for every given second. There's around 6,000 test subjects, 4,000 of which were tested again three to eight years later. Uh, this data set has two cohorts, two recording cohorts. Um, again, there were two EEG signals, two EEG sensors outputting two EEG values for any given recording. And interestingly, this data set also includes survey data that was answered by the patient and the human recorder for the sleep stages. There are multiple related works that have tried to tackle this problem, and they are shown here. So what's interesting about the SHHS data set is it needed a lot of pre-processing. It was available in .edf files that were not particularly ready for training a machine learning slash neural network model. And so we created a ETL tool to load this into a more readily consumable CSV format. And that tool is available on github.com slash sleep study slash SHHS underscore prepper. 
it produces a CSV file where each row represents the data points that were recorded for a provided uh, segment length. You can see what uh, columns the CSV file has generated. Uh, on the right is basically are basically the column labels we've chosen for our particular uh, training of our model. Um, but this tool allows you to sample and uh, obtain patients at your own will, at your own accord. Uh, the labels, the columns that uh, you can kind of manipulate are basically things like and obtain are things like subject ID, which is the patient's uh, ID, uh, whether they were in cohort one or cohort two, as there were two uh, sleep, uh, study experiments that were done. Uh, they were off from each other by a couple of years. Whether that patient was in cohort one or in cohort two, whether this particular sleep stage uh, reading was from the cohort one or cohort two, what was the sleep stage for that given recording, and whether it's the first EEG value that was recorded or the second EEG value, the third EEG value, so on and so forth. Um, again, these are the parameters that you can use to control, uh, to pass and control the ETL tool with. Uh, you can pass how many EDF samples to batch together, how many EEG values to batch together. This affects uh, how many EEG values go into the same row. So say um, you want to break the default of 125 hertz, right? You want to store in the same row instead of storing 125 values, which means you're recording for each row one second of data. You want to store 15 seconds worth of data. You can change batch size to be 125 times 15 to store 15 seconds worth of EEG data. You can also pass and control how many patients go into creating a particular CSV data set, uh, whether to interlace EEG1 and EEG2 sensor signals and sensor values in the same row or not, uh, the path to the ACHHS data set, the path to uh, where the result the CSV should go, and whether to profile it or not. So you can learn more about what it does on the GitHub repo if you are interested. Uh, the PhysioNet dataset differs from the SHHS dataset in the fact that uh, we it had only one sensor that was recording at 100 hertz, meaning 100 values were recorded for every given second, one one hundredth of a second. Uh, we used 30 seconds as time windows, and using the f using the fact that there are 30 seconds used as time windows and 100 values for every given second, there are 3,000 data points for each corresponding time window. There are 12 subjects used for training, four subjects for validation, and four subjects for testing. Um, the sleep cassette data set have multiple features, but we only focus on that one value that we cared about, the EG value. And if you look into that cassette, uh, the feature name is called EEG FPZ uh, slash CZ. So for the PhysioNet models, we built three architectures. We built a multi-layer perceptron that has an input size of 3,000. Uh, given the fact that we have 30 second time windows and for each second we're recording 100 hertz, 100 values of EEG data, we're basically uh, giving into the neural network uh, 30 seconds of um, the input is 30 seconds worth of EEG data, and we're getting out of that neural network uh, some value, some uh, sleep stage value. There are three hidden layers, uh, each with 100, uh, respectively, one, the first hidden layer with 128 nodes, the second with 1024 nodes, and the last one with 128 nodes again. And the sigmoid activation function was used for each layer. There are five output nodes because there are five sleep stages for the PhysioNet dataset. The multi-layer perceptron performance has 50% accuracy. As you can see, it clearly overfits on the training data, and for some reason, it seems to favor the sleep stage 2 um, sleep stage. Uh, for the convolutional neural network architecture, there are 
two uh, 1D convolutional layers. The first 1D convolutional layer, layer has 16 filters of size 5 with stride 1. The second 1D convolutional layer has 32 filters of size 5 with stride 1. And the ReLU activation function and max pooling with uh, size and stride of 2 were used after each convolutional layer. The fully connected layers had 128 nodes, followed by a ReLU activation function and a dropout of 0 0.5. And last but not least, five output nodes corresponding to each sleep stage were uh, used for the output layer, along with the softmax transform. Uh, for the CNN performance, it performed and fared a bit better than the multi-layer perceptron. It had a 65% accuracy on the validation set, 95% accuracy on the training set. It still overfits and it classifies the wake state and the sleep stage 2 state pretty fairly. Now, it does a particular bad job at classifying sleep stage 1 and a somewhat decent classification on sleep stage 3 and the rapid eye movement stage. Last but not least, our current neural network architecture has three layers, each with a hidden state of size 64, a dropout of 0 0.5, and a fully connected layer with five output nodes, for each, one for each uh, sleep stage. And again, it uses the softmax transform for the output layer. The recurrent neural network's performance has 75% accuracy and it only overfits on sleep stage one. Now for the SHHS sleep uh, heart health study uh, models, um, we created a um, local distributed model training and evaluation framework. It's available at github.com slash sleep study slash SHHS underscore models. Uh, it generates uh, multiple plots on the x-axis is each subject that was used for testing a given model and the, and on the y-axis you have the patient that was used to train a model. So what is SHHS models? Well it's a local again a local distributed model eval evaluation framework for the SHHS data set. It creates and spawns off a its own process for a given uh, model given model trained on a specific patient and evaluated against all the other patients for a given data set. Now we wanted to parallelize the uh, training one model and testing it against all the other patients for every single patient on a data set to speed this process up and let us iterate a lot faster. And this was done and accomplished using shared memory and multiprocessing. Um, the, the framework has a lot of interesting uh, uh, plugins. You can change what scoring metrics are used to evaluate a given model. We used an quote unquote all scoring metric which grabs the um, mean, mean balanced accuracy and F1 score for a given model and whenever we're evaluating it. Um, the struggles with building this tool and uh, doing this parallel uh, evaluation is in the fact that, as you can see on the uh, activity monitor, the RAM usage, memory usage, is overtaking the physical memory that's available on the computer. The memory, uh, the physical memory on my computer is only 8 gigs, and yet uh, the memory used combined with the swap used at points, at uh, certain points, have gone up to 15, 16 gigabytes. It, it the memory usage is growing linearly uh, with respect to the sleep stage data set, and this is not good. And so, what we did to fix this problem is use shared arrays. We deserialize a NumPy data structure into a shared array, and we serialize it back into a NumPy data structure when needed. Uh, we don't do any lock primitives on this data structure since um, each process uh, touches a specific part of this matrix and so we didn't need to govern a locking around this data structure since it's only touching a specific portion of a matrix in that shared memory space. As you can see, interestingly, our memory usage has gone down from growing linearly with respect to the data set to a constant memory usage 
of around 2 gigabytes, 3 gigabytes, which is constant relative to the data set size, uh, as opposed to before where it grows linearly with the data set size. Um, we generated two models using this evaluation framework, one with random forest and the other with random forest using PCA dimension reduction. We wanted to just test out shallow learning methods. As you can see, random forest fared um, a bit better than PCA across all three metrics. PCA uh, choosing a component of size 10 loses some of the variance of the original data set, which uh, is showing which undermines the reason of why random forest, uh, the original model is performing to the uh, modified model that has dimension reduction done on it. Uh, we've used three scoring metrics across the models. We've used the F1 scoring, we've used mean accuracy with, and mean balance accuracy. And again, mean accuracy, um, this is uh, prone to a class that dominates all the other classes given how frequent it happens on a given data set. Mean balanced accuracy balances all the classes regardless of how, how frequently they happen across a data set. And F1 score is a nice uh, uh, average between these two. It takes into account the mean accuracy and the mean balanced accuracy while also taking into account precision and recall. Uh, and so for our conclusions, for PhysioNet, the GRU model overperforms uh, and performs well better, better than the multi-layer perceptron and CNN architecture since its model is better suited for time series data. For f further work, we would like to experiment more with other time series based models, particularly long short term memory networks. Uh, training time of a uh, recurrent neural network is much longer than an ML uh, multi-layer perceptron in a convolutional neural network. Shared memory is very important for parallelizing tasks with data access to giant data structures. And finally, random for forest classifiers, classifiers were not necessarily a good fit for the SHHS dataset. Now, this is interesting because our team has worked on multiple models across multiple data sets, focusing not only on the actual uh, machine learning, but also the big data aspect of things. We've used Spark, we've used Python, we've dealt with shared memory and multi-processing pools, and um, particularly with Spark and with Spark uh, distributed functions. And so this was a very interesting big data outcome. And that is it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, again, this is Alistair for the uh, team sleep stage study. And thank you for listening to our presentation.